the Kocha wanted to send a prayer to the sun. So he called on his friend, the bear. And the bear came, and he said, oh, I'm very honored to be asked to do this, but I can, I can only take it to the top of the highest tree. But I know someone who can. So let's call Eagle. And so Eagle was called, and Eagle said, yes, I can try. And so Eagle flew and flew and flew up, 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 and got to the sun and delivered the prayer. And the sun was so taken with this, he said, give me one of your feathers. And so the eagle plucked out a tail feather and gave it to the sun, and the sun kissed that feather, which is why, you know, eagle feathers are black on the end, and it's, it's because the sun sends them there. He said, take this back, and forever this will be my recognition of my special people. Along the Mississippi River, six miles from present-day St. Louis, Missouri, there stood a city that once dominated the heart of the continent. At its center was a powerful leader. A great number of years ago, there appeared among us a man who came down from the sun. This man told us that he had seen from on high that we did not govern ourselves well, that we had no master, that each of us had presumption enough to think himself capable of governing others while he could not even conduct himself. A thousand years ago, the great son, a leader who was both king and pope, lived atop a man-made royal mountain 10 stories high, its 16-acre base larger than any pyramid in Egypt. He told us that in order to live in peace among ourselves, we must observe the following points. We must never kill anyone but in defense of our own lives. We must never know any woman besides our own. We must never take any things that belong to another. We must never lie, nor get drunk. We must not be avaricious. We must give generously and with joy and share our subsistence with those who are in need of it. From the heights of his royal estate, the great sun mediated between the Creator and the people, between the sun and the earth. This is Cahokia, city of the sun. The great sun ruled the thriving center of a vast Mississippian culture. Outside the walled city, communities of farmers, hunters, and fishermen stretched for miles, surrounded by fields of corn. With 20,000 residents, no city in the United States would surpass Cahokia's historic size before 1800. Only then would Philadelphia's population eclipse the ancient center. These people lived in uh, daub and wattle houses on top. The, the principal people did, the priest and the royalty. They lived in, in very substantial houses, not teepees, not teepees, teepees. Western Plains people. Down here, they lived in houses. They were sedentary, they were farmers, they used the rivers and the miles and the streams as uh, not only for commerce, but for sustenance as well. With the Mississippi and other major rivers as its highways, Cahokia was linked by trade to a third of the continent. Copper arrived from the Great Lakes, obsidian from Yellowstone, mica and crystal from the Appalachians, gold and silver from Canada, shell from the Gulf of Mexico.
look at these old live oak trees that have seen so much pass by them. Magnificently dressed Indian people coming down that by in a dugout, uh, greeting people standing right here on this bank of having a good time, because they did. You know, Indian people have always known how to have a good time. And there would be a feast prepared. And the women would put the corn together. They'd make sofki. Um, they would roast a deer. The people would bring gifts. You never go to an Indian's house without bringing something. That's as old as the sunrise. Cahokia was the pinnacle of a mound-building culture with traditions dating back to before 1000 BC. Thousands of mounds still dot the landscape from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico. An average funeral mound in the Ohio Valley was three stories tall. Construction could represent 200,000 man hours of labor or 100 men carrying the baskets of earth for a year. But few mounds compare with the religious effigy located 50 miles east of Cincinnati, Ohio, the Great Serpent Mound. The enormous snake stretches over 400 yards in length. While their earthworks are the mound builders' most visible legacy, their smaller creations are their most beautiful. Only glimpses remain of the people who changed the course of life on the northern continent. Most of their material world, wooden buildings, boats, baskets, woven textiles, leather footwear, and clothes, have long since turned to dust. An old Caddo relative of mine said that I used to go outside and, and hold my hands up and, and bless myself with the sun, a hot. Uh, well, I can't do that anymore because they say we sun worshipers. So we didn't worship the sun. We worship what was behind it, the power behind it. In the 19th century, 2,000 miles south of Cahokia, a group of European explorers carved their way into the jungles of southern Mexico. There, buried for centuries and surrounded by massive pyramids, they came upon a royal palace, resplendent with grand rooms, courts, and a tower. The Europeans recognized that by their own standards, the site was a legacy of greatness. Standing in the middle of the largest Indian nation in North America, the Maya, descendants of the pyramid builders, the explorers could not imagine that the towering architecture was the work of Indian people. Instead, they speculated wildly about the lost civilization that could have built so grand an existence. Refugees from the sunken continent of Atlantis, a lost tribe of Israel, seafarers from the Orient, even beings from another planet. They considered everything but the obvious. In 1949, a Mexican archaeologist came to the same magnificent ruins, now known as Palenque, He climbed the steps to the top of the largest pyramid, the Temple of the Inscription. There he noticed holes in the floor below the capstones. He removed the slabs 
and discovered a rubble-filled passageway descending deep into the pyramid's heart. After three years of excavation, the passage was cleared. At the bottom was a tomb that had been buried for over 1,200 years. It would unlock the history of Palenque and help to reveal the past of the Mayan people, a past they left for the future to read. For centuries, Mayan glyphs were considered complex picture stories like Egyptian hieroglyphics. Only in the 1980s did archaeologists finally recognize that it was true writing. They were not looking at pictures to be interpreted, but symbols for sounds to be read. It was the Maya language. Instantly, a door was opened on the past. Beneath the five-ton sarcophagus cover at Palenque lay Pakal, shield in the Maya language. He was born in 603 AD. His head was bound at birth to enlarge his forehead, a fashion that marked him as a member of the royal elite. He wore a cosmetic bridge on his nose and decorated his hair with water lilies. Pakal rose to power at the age of 12. He would build a holy city and rule for nearly 70 years, leading Palenque during a time of greatness and growth in the Mayan world. As the Maya expanded, over 60 capital cities emerged. Their growth fueled by a successful agricultural society. of Mayan agriculture reached back thousands of years and stretched across Mexico and into Central America. Now, friends and brothers, listen to these words of dreaming. Spring rains give us life and bring forth the golden corn silk. By the time of Christ, there were millions of people in the region with agriculture allowing populations to settle and expand. Art, mathematics, astronomy, architecture, priesthoods, and royalty all flourished. By the mid-700s, at Palenque alone, the sons of Pakal ruled over 200,000 Maya living in regional communities of farmers, weavers, stonemasons, and feather workers. But the golden age of building and growth would be transformed by a new era of war and destruction. For reasons still locked in the past, the Mayan world turned against itself. Farmers became soldiers. By 800 AD, an era had ended. 
most of the capitals that had been among the living wonders of human creation.